Hello. Um, I'm uh, Theodor Rat. I'm going to talk about OpenBSD and about our release process. So um, this is the synopsis that I have for the talk, which is in the brochure. Do you want the microphone? Okay. 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 Okay, is this good? Is that good? Yeah, it's on. Yeah, okay. Okay. Good enough? Everybody can hear me? Yes? Okay. 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 Um, I'm the project leader for OpenBSD. Um, I've been doing this for getting close to 15 years. Um, as well as being the project leader and directing people and telling them how to do things, I also am a developer. I've worked in almost every part of the source tree. And um, I have a third role, which is to be the release engineer. Um, um, so I have to coordinate everything and make sure that everybody can actually eventually do a release. Now, I should probably explain in step by step what OpenBSD is and in some way perhaps explain why it's a little bit different from other things. Everything's different for everything else, but I'll explain why OpenBSD is different. So it's a general purpose operating system. There's about 80 developers at a time. People come and go, their lives change. Um, there's lots of good stuff in our source tree, but our users, just like the users of all of your software, they don't want to go and read the source code, they actually want to run it. So I'll just, uh, here's a little picture over here showing approximately how, how often OpenBSD gets changes. We're talking a median of probably about 50 changes a day. And once in a while, we have events called hackathons where we throw up to 60 people into a room at the same time for a week. And we have these spikes of up to 300 commits being made in a day to our tree all the way throughout the entire subsystems. And uh, once in a while, I go on holidays. <laughs> <laughs> That appears to be the last one. Uh, <laughs> well, back then we didn't have as many developers. We probably only had 20. So when I went away, they slowed down. Um, but these days, when I go away, there doesn't seem to be any slowdown in the development. So our users prefer to run the code. So eventually, all systems, all pieces of software, have to go through a release cycle. You have to offer the code that you have out to your users. And you have to not just give them the code as it is. You have to give them a good version of it. Okay. On a regular basis, we're always working on our source trees, but we're going to have periods when our source is not very good. We're going to have times when we're aggressively developing and we're making changes that are perhaps not ready for the people to run. So we have to find moments and times and do cleanup to make sure that the release is ready. Because that's what the users want. They want the best that we've got to offer. Why, why give them less? So the cycle that we usually go through in almost all the projects, and you'll see diagrams like this on the internet if you search for release engineering or things like that, is we do, de we do development of our source tree, then we go into the release cycle, and then we make it available to people. And when we're in that release cycle, before we actually release, we discover we have to do testing. And based on that testing, we repair the source tree. Now, I've put testing after release, which you might find odd. The way many people think is they say, we're going to go into a release mode. And that's when they do their testing. So they actually do their testing after they've decided to go into release mode. They don't do their testing beforehand. It's a sad thing, but it's the truth. Unfortunately, a lot of projects sort of do very poor releases. So since they skip doing releases, they skip doing testing. I'm just going to look at this. See. We use this phrase release engineering, although you do find some people now talking about release management. And pretty soon we're probably going to have release uh, human, resor human resource departments or something like that. They're trying to push the problem away from actually feeling responsible for what they're doing. When we talk about engineering, we're talking about very carefully being aware of every single component of the way that something would work. And the larger things get, the more careful you have to be. So when people talk about release engineering in the modern world today, I don't think they're doing anything close to engineering because they're not paying attention to any of these fundamental things that we use as the definition for the word engineering. They're ignoring the entire environment that they're in. They're ignoring the complexity of what they've got. I'm, I don't want to ruffle any feathers. So I have to be really careful when I talk about other projects. 
I'm going to try in this talk to talk mostly about OpenBSD and not pick on other projects, especially those who are in the room. But you, you, you kind of will notice that a lot of people are trying to do the same thing as companies. Okay? They, for example, OpenSolaris. They have this source tree with OpenSolaris where they have one development team or with people all over the world who are making changes. But they have two release teams. They have Solaris for the commercial customers and OpenSolaris for other people. And they have different policies for how that code is actually released to people. I guess they're a company and they can afford to do that. They can throw the money at it to ensure these people are employed. They can throw the time at it to do this as two processes. And they have the people. Some of the Linuxes are starting to do a similar model as well. Fedora with Red Hat. Could you also perhaps call Debian and Ubuntu to be the same sort of thing? They're running into other problems as well, though. They have a lot of latency. Um, a typical Debian release now will take years. They, they say that they're going to make a release, and then it just drags on and on, and they never actually succeed at getting out the door. FreeBSD, try not to ruffle any feathers here, they have a lot of people in the group who focus on ensuring that once a release is made, that it's maintained longer into time. Perhaps that takes a lot of people out of the development team who could actually be doing development. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe that's the way those people actually, that's the skill set that they actually have, is to maintain something like that. I don't know. There's, of course, similar release engineering things happening in many non-operating system projects, all the way from Mozilla down to the smallest little package tool that we're used to using. And there's X11. And since I don't think there's a lot of X11 people in this room, I can pick on them. So the X11 me release methodology doesn't really exist anymore. It's kind of like the X developers got tired of doing releases, and so they just stopped doing releases. But before they got to that point, they split X into 200 components. And each of those components is maintained by a separate developer or a separate group of developers and released entirely on the schedule that that person or that group wants. So the process they have is that they do development, and then they throw something overboard, and then people complain, and they go and repair it, and they go back and develop, and they throw it out, and there's no testing. The bits of testing are done out there once these releases have happened. But before a release has happened, essentially no development, no, no testing happens. There's no official policy in the X group anymore for how people are supposed to coordinate this. Of course, we come along as, as software projects, and we have to find a layer. We have to put X in between our operating system and many of the applications that we ship in the package tree. We have to insert X in there. And X has decided this isn't their problem. It's now our problem. So every project has to have their own X maintainer. But he's not just an X maintainer. He's a guy who has to pick through 200 module pieces for X and select the ones that work together. And it's never the newest ones. And it actually never is ones that happen to have come out at the same time. It is an incredible problem. I'm certain that the FreeBSD people have been running into these problems as well. That the i3D6 driver has to be this vintage. The ATI driver has to be this vintage. You've got 17x libraries, and you have to pick different pieces over here. X term, newest versions, the newest versions of X term don't even run on 64-bit platforms, and people are waiting for a patch, and the font configuration is a complete nightmare. I think the new toolchain has similar problems. Bits of binutils don't work with bits of GCC. Um, yep. Yeah. Yep. So, we have, um, in our group, we have a developer, Matthew Herb, um, and he is very high up in the X hierarchy as a developer. He's worked on many, many pieces of X, and uh, he doesn't do any more development X in X really anymore. Pretty much in our source tree, his full-time job is to, make, is to select pieces of X. That's integration, not development. So I'm, I'm explaining with this critique of X that this is the worst case that a project can get to, where completely ignoring the release process has t taken a source tree which 
was in the past known for a certain level of quality and has taken it to the point where quality isn't even something you can, you can use as a description when you say the word X11. So, so let's say what we would actually want if we were to try to manage our source code correctly. An ideal release process would have all of these, these factors. We want to do the, as much testing as we can before we give our code to our users. To do that, we want the maximum number of people testing it in different environments. We want this to go as quickly as possible before the testers get bored and the developers aren't doing any work. We want it to be easy so that nobody gets bored, so that the testers keep doing their job. We actually, it'd be really cool if at the end of this test cycle we were friends. And if this works out, we would probably end up shipping a really high quality release, showcasing all of the new features that we've added to our system. Our developers would be happy because the source tree is, is free and they can make new changes. They'd be happy because people are starting to use the new things that they spent the last um, cycle working on. The users would be thrilled because all these things they've heard coming down the pipeline have finally happened. And development is happening again, and we'll see when we get to the next release. But it, it doesn't quite work out that way. This, th these problems show, all, show up all the time. The, the release becomes incredibly painful because some major regression is found, and it turns out it was thrown into the source tree six, seven months ago, and the developer who worked on it is now busy in school, or he's in holiday in Patagonia, or or who knows? And so suddenly we are faced with an issue of sometimes taking layers of newer code and separating them from the old change and separating it out. And we are, we're not doing development. We're being repository monkeys. We're picking through the good bits and the bad bits. And we're doing exactly the same as the X11 developers were doing, are forcing other people to do to our own source tree. And since that process is so painful, it takes a long time. And now our release is late. And since it's late, the developers are not having any fun, and the testers give up. So quite often in the past, we've seen that the testing starts off very aggressively. Everyone's very optimistic. And then the optimism starts to fail. And eventually, you just release what you've got anyways. And now it's buggy. And now you've got frustrated users. And an entire meme starts showing up in the community that they're used to that piece of software actually being buggy. It's completely acceptable. Don't be so surprised. And this frustrates the developers. Because there's nothing they want more than to have their code be used by people who need it. And the whole thing just gets worse and worse, and your entire project becomes unhealthy in a social sense. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was, that, I, I went through this 20 years ago, and that's why we've changed our process. Uh, just, the memories are just too painful. So, another thing that some other projects do, um, FreeBSD does this, and I've, I've never understood this, so I don't want to be really critical about it, but I don't understand, is how sometimes projects ship things, and then, since they have some bugs in them, they then maintain them. And they develop, uh, and they build up an entire team inside the group, which maintains older releases and brings features forward. And it seems such a waste to take people who could be developing, but maybe that's the niche for those people, or maybe that's the job where they're using the software. So I don't, I don't understand it, but I can understand it. But I mean, having like 11 re -release, end releases, like what is it? Is it five? Is it is it the five series or free four series of FreeBSD with dot 11? and probably dot 12 coming or something. I, I, I find that really weird. I don't understand the concept. I, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just saying I don't understand it. Okay. So I, I find this, when we're in these projects and we have uh, very limited work power, work, uh, very limited amount of people who can work on these things, and I find it strange to take, or to even allow people to work on things which are of such minimal benefit. I find that, I, I think myself that having our software the main head moving forward in time very rapidly is a, a better thing. But maybe that's just me. So let's look at the typical way that a regular process works inside uh, most projects. So we're just going to say the release period over here in the blue line coming straight down is approximately for what, what most projects consider to be their development period before they, they make a decision 
to make a release. So they unlock the tree from the previous release, they go through their development cycle, and at some point they get they start saying, we should make a release soon. We think our code's probably ready in some way, so they slow down. And then what many projects do is they tag the tree and they branch it. And they say, this we think is a good place for us to start doing our testing, and they hand it off. And the tree unlocks so that future development can happen, and you've got this branch, which you now will consider your zeroth release candidate, and then you'll start fixing it and getting it ready for a release. So this is the process that's been taught to everybody, right? And here's what actually happens when you do this. So you unlock the tree, and all your developers go work on the new code. And the people who actually think that you should be making a release, they go work on the release. So what you've done now is you've just split your team in two. You've taken all your people who actually know how the system works, and are active core developers, and you've thrown them off into the future, and you've taken all your people who actually want to make a release, and you've turned them into testing teams. And they're a smaller team now. And what happens is, since you didn't spend much time slowing down beforehand, you're going to find bugs in your cycle now. And so these testers find a bug, and quite often it turns out it's a bug they can't fix themselves. So they have to hand off this report to the people off in the testing community, who are actually already by this point in time running a different version of the operating system because they're moving ahead. They'll fix it over there, and then somebody has to port it back into the branch and apply it over there. So you rinse and repeat, go around in the cycle, until these people who are doing the, the release cycle decide it's a happy enough place for them to ship this release and feel proud of it, and then they ship it. So the thing to worry about here, I think, is how many people are actually doing this testing. Okay? And we could say, like, in the worst cases, could get to the X11 sort of thing where, for example, the X-term patches that are being sent out by the X-term developer, uh, it's him and another guy. Okay? So that's how bad a project could actually get. And by the time he shipped it, and it ends up in an actual distribution, like a Red Hat or something, he's off running something five versions forward, so he doesn't even know what they're doing, and he has to rethink where he was at. All the processes get dragged out. There's no focus. Okay. So I want to show our release calendar. We unlock the tree early in the cycle. And we allow very large things to, to go into the tree. These large things are usually things which were developed over the past while, but we didn't allow them to go into the tree. We'll continue on for, for most of the six months until we get to a point where we decide that we're going to make a release. By the way, we make a release exactly on six month lines. The official release day is always the same. But where that slowdown happens depends on how comfortable we feel about the source tree. We warn all of our users and our developers to start doing testing now. Okay? They don't have to do significant testing, but they have to start seeing if they spot anything that makes them feel uncomfortable. And after this goes on for a couple of days, I start noticing that no one cares about doing testing anymore. They're instead doing active development anymore, still. So I just randomly on one day go and say, the APIs and the, and the ABIs between all the interfaces are locked. No more changes can happen to a very significant section of the tree. The day that happens, we tell all of our ports and package people that they can start doing their builds. Then we lock the tree. We do testing. We tag the tree. And we release. Sorry, and we allow the development to continue on. But you see this little thing coming off over here on the side over here. And it's, it may seem like it's the same on the previous um, diagram, but it's not. I want to point out that this is a very short period, actually. And we've taken all the developers, we've kept them in the cycle of actually testing the tree. We haven't allowed them to go and play with the future. They're, paying, they're, they're playing in the present. Okay? We're able to do this because of a number of reasons. One reason is that we don't actually make releases only on that day. We make a release a day. We have snapshots, and I'm certain other projects have snapshots as well. But we use them on all of our machines. On any particular day, I may reboot CVS, and now I'm running current. My laptop is always running current. 
Any change we make to the source tree pretty much by the next two or three days, as soon as I reboot a machine, I always reboot it to the new kernel. We in our group call this eating our own dog food. So if there's mistakes, we'd rather run, it, run into them right away while the change is fresh in our mind, rather than later on. So what, what happens in our process is since we're always making snapshots which are good enough for us to use as our own releases, when we get close to the final release cycle, all we have to do is a little bit of fine tuning. And I'll now tell you about this ABI API lock that we do. We, this is the whole system that OpenBSD ships. Up at the top, you'll see the kernel, and there's a whole bunch of things which we don't want people to change. We lock these suddenly on a surprise day. If those things stay the same, then it turns out that all of the packages can be built, because we will not change one thing that they actually depend upon. This means, if you look at the build time of our systems, you can see some of our architectures take up to a month to build all of the packages. We can start that build while we are still up in this cycle. The package builds can start even before the release and before we fix all the final regressions. Assuming there are no regressions in the a API, that we don't have to change the APIs or the, AP or the ABI. And as a general rule, we don't do that. We don't run into those problems. So, what, what, so this, this, this is a, a very happy thing, I think, for, for, uh, for all the, the developers and the testers. The, it's, it's just fantastic. It's, I, don't know, I don't know how to say it. Uh, th this, this was a real innovation, I think. So the locks, as I said, are entire, entirely surprise events. No one knows when they're actually going to happen. That's because people who know that a lock is going to happen will decide that they've got something else better to do. Uh, and we can't afford to have uh, problems in the cycle. We had periods um, probably about uh, five, six, seven years ago when the developers didn't want to do testing and they would basically find reasons to go and do other things. And we actually, for two or three releases, ran a, a punishment process. Uh, the punishment cycle was that people who were not mentioned specifically as having participated in the testing process uh, weren't allowed to commit for two weeks until after the source tree had unlocked for everybody else. That brought people back into line and now we have pretty much full participation in the test cycle. Uh, the test cycle is no longer more than about two weeks long. Back then, I think we, had, we found it necessary to run a month-long test cycle. Now the test cycle is just final little things. Does, it work or not? Does everything work as well as it did previous release? And we assume everything else will probably work better. So this is the difference. All the developers work on the release, and once we've split off that branch, it's one person. It's me. Since all the packages have been built by all the developers or are already in progress, I don't have to worry about that. All the developers can continue working on the new code. And all I have to do is make sure that all the, the, the base snapshots for the last day that we chose was safe can go onto a CD, get shipped off to the plant, and we just get ready for the official release date. And I, can, I myself can even go back to regular development. So the, the entire period that we've got over there is probably only a month. In fact, I'm trying to see if we can get this down to about 10 days. We've never managed to get it down to 10 days. I think uh, 4.1 4 we got it down to two weeks. Let's see if we can do better in the future. So to reiterate, the problem we're avoiding is to not split our development and release teams. Because then you're going to have poor testing and you're going to have a poor release. Again, like I said, the entire operation is completely upside down from what regular projects do. We actually do our builds before the source tree is completely locked. Now, I, I'll readily admit that some people are not going to be able to do this with their source trees. OpenBSD is very monolithic. It's one source tree for the base. It's all combined. It's, it's, we don't have to depend on anything. 
Once in a while, we'll do a new bin utils merge or a new GCC merge. Uh, other than that, it's all our own components. If we decide we have to make a major change in the ABIs or the APIs or some subsystem, we'll make it early in a release cycle so that the code has time to settle for three or four months. If a developer comes up with something quite late in the cycle, we'll just tell them to wait because we can give them a firm promise as to when we'll be unlocking the source tree again. And I, therefore, because of these constraints, I know that other projects aren't like that. They may use external components. They, they may pull them and update them on a regular basis. Um, they, they may prefer the cycle of doing slightly less perfect releases and then maintaining them and thinking that this, this pseudo point zero release followed by other things is actually acceptable to the users. It might be. I don't know. Or they, they may think that, it, that because of the size of their user community or something else, that it's more valuable for them to have a head of the source tree that doesn't compile every day and decide to push it out somewhere else. In OpenBSD, a source tree that doesn't compile for more than five minutes means the person who committed it is an idiot. And that person gets punished. He gets mocked. And we're not very kind. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, any questions or comments <laughs> about whether perhaps some of you could do the same sort of things to your things, to your projects? So, yes, I mean, one of the reasons that FreeBSD has the, the sort of long tail is because it ends up vendors put it into things, and for them to go to a new release every six months is just not a viable strategy for them. Uh, do you, find that you don't have people that are using it in that way, or do they have some other way of coping with the fact that there are two or three or four releases behind? Um, we, we don't run into the situation uh, with the people I talk to. Um, the older, I mean, we don't have any security changes which have to be pushed back into older reason, older versions. That's, I think, perhaps the main thing with OpenBSD. We, we've, we've been so successful at, at at fixing the security problems that are in a typical Unix operating system going back maybe about five, six, seven years, that there are so few errata for security reasons. I mean, for security reasons are the number one reason, I think, why people want their old version to be patchable. And it just doesn't exist in our field. So I'm perfectly happy with the wireless access point at my house actually running OpenBSD 3.8 because it doesn't have any holes. So I don't have to update it. But if I did update it, I would probably put a snapshot onto it and then not worry about it for a couple of years. It's a, it's a different mentality, but I think it really comes out of, I don't know, I don't know. Do, 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 um, David, you run at a large university. What do you run on your production machines? Snapshots. <laughs> <laughs> it's... The interfaces don't change enough for version compatibility to be an issue for us. So we just go with the current thing. And for companies that use it in the basis of a product, then they're going to take a copy of the source code and they're going to patch it themselves. And because we don't have the security issues, they're fine maintaining that for two year cycles or three year cycles themselves. So they take that responsibility, we don't. Okay. We also have a, 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 another aspect of the ABI and API that's a little bit different. We do. We do a major and a minor on our shared library numbers, and we're very aggressive about increasing the minor numbers whenever an API addition happens, and we're very aggressive about changing the major number whenever an API disappears or changes. And we're super aggressive about this so that any change in the ABI from any of the libraries, from the source tree even into the packages, uses this double major minor, the old SunOS style major and minor versions. We are very aggressive about increasing those numbers. Even in the package tree, we don't use the vendor library numbers. We use our own. We increment them whenever we don't trust the vendor. So that allows you to actually crisscross and match packages all the way through a machine and partially update it, and we don't end up with library conflicts. The new way of using ELF version, versioning, uh, we don't think it works. So, so we just don't change things. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>